My name is Heather Vokush, and thank you for joining us on another segment of the Manhattan Neighborhood Network's series on the broader implications of war. Now, tonight we will be looking at the issue of atomic bomb survivors, which, of course, is an incredibly important issue now in light of the current nuclear crisis in Japan. Now, Fumiko Hashizumi was there during the atomic bombing of um, Hiroshima. Of course, as you know, the United States dropped atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki in 1945. Over 100,000 people died, and their survivors have been struggling ever since. It's critical that we learn from atomic bomb survivors. In addition, however, it's critical that we apply those lessons again to current events. So we will be listening to excerpts of uh, uh, information that one of the atomic bomb survivors gave. We also will learn more about the Japan-based NGO called Peace Boat, which is actively working not only to bring the voices of atomic bomb survivors to the world, but also to currently provide support to people who have been affected by the nuclear crisis in Japan. Now, we also are going to be joined by Dr. Kathleen Sullivan, who is a disarmament educator. She also is an activist. She has been working on the nuclear issue for 20 years. She is currently the program director for Hibakusha Stories, and she will tell you more about that. In addition, um, she, um, Dr. Kathleen Sullivan is guest educator for Peace Boats project that helps bring atomic bomb survivors' stories out to the world. In addition, Dr. Sullivan has been an education consultant to the United Nations Office for Disarmament Affairs in New York, and she has produced two films about survivors from Nagasaki. Dr. Kathleen Sullivan lives in Brooklyn. And welcome Thank to you. the program. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you, Heather. Now, can you tell us a little bit about Hibakusha Stories? Well, Hibakusha Stories um, is an initiative uh, here in New York City that um, we're an all-volunteer base of um, incredible people, name mostly artists and um, educators. And I work with um, Robert Kroonquist, who was a New York City public school teacher for 23 years at Jamaica High School. And Robert and I um, have created a sort of work, hearing the testimony of survivors through the lens of the visual and performing arts. So we bring survivors from Hiroshima and Nagasaki and some who are living outside of Japan to New York City where we work primarily with high school students and the students listen to the stories of the survivors and then they respond through some sort of artistic uh, means. We have students that are writing one-act plays, we have students that are making short films, um, we have students that are creating photo projects. On Thursday this week, we're going to Brooklyn International High School where students are folding paper cranes and they're in partnership with a um, foundation that will be paying $2 for every paper crane that they fold and donating that towards um, the tsunami earthquake relief efforts in Japan. So mm -hmm. telling students the story of survival and hope mm -hmm. and by engaging them in these incredible uh, stories, we're also empowering them with the tools to work for a nuclear weapon-free world. I mean, that sounds just like a phenomenal organization. It really does. Can, can you give us some examples? Um, are the students surprised by the stories that they hear? What, uh, what are some of the reactions that you've gotten? Well, I can say that I know this just because it's on one of our brochures, but mm -hmm. one of the quotes um, from the students, it was, it made me realize how instantly and suddenly the world as we know it could, could turn to nothing but ashes and dust. Mm. 
And so students um, who have lived through September 11th here um, in New York City mm -hmm. understand that what happened in Hiroshima and Nagasaki are on orders of magnitude um, much bigger, mm -hmm. which is not to say that mm -hmm. human suffering is human suffering. So that's not to put play mm -hmm. down any mm -hmm. form of human suffering. But mm -hmm. the difference with nuclear weapons, which we really try to help the students understand, mm -hmm. is that not only do you have immense heat um, from the nuclear explosion, uh, e extraordinary blast, you know, for hurricane force winds, um, these kind of things that don't occur in nature that happen as a result of a nuclear explosion. But you also have the lingering invisible effect of radiation. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so that those nuclear bombs that were dropped in Hiroshima and Nagasaki in 1945, over 65 years ago, mm -hmm. are still creating illness mm -hmm. and disease mm -hmm. and um, genetic anomalies mm -hmm. um, over 65 years later. So we uh, try to engender um, a different kind of response that engages our moral imagination. Mm -hmm. Because when we're talking about um, long-lived radionuclides that result from a nuclear explosion, um, we're inhabiting different notions of time. Mm -hmm. So just the one example of plutonium, you have a half-life of 24,000 years. Yeah. That means that it will roughly be uh, dangerous for 250,000 years, carcinogenic, mutagenic. This is something that we can't hardly imagine. Mm -hmm. So that's mm -hmm. another reason why we bring in the artistic forms so that students can use their right brain to um, try mm -hmm. to imagine what it means when we are inhabiting a world with nuclear weapons mm -hmm. and also, by extension, nuclear power and the whole nuclear fuel cycle. Well, that makes a lot of sense. And actually, I would like to return to what you said about things happening so fast, you know, in, in this kind of, you know, nuclear attack. As mentioned before, there is a woman named Fumiko Hashizumi. Now, Fumiko Hashizumi was interviewed by Rosalva Welch of Peace Boat. And Fumiko Hashizumi was a, sur well, is a survivor of the atomic bombing, and sh her interview appears in a book of interviews of women about World War II. Now, I would like to read you just a brief excerpt that describes how quickly life changed for her. Here again is an excerpt from Fumiko Hashizumi. This was after, just directly after this happened. I started to head down the staircase in the back of the building when I came across one of the cleaning ladies of the facility. She was naked because her clothes had been blown right off her, and her pink intestines were spilling out of her stomach. The blast had been so fast that she hadn't had time to throw herself onto the ground to protect her abdominal area. She was still alive, however, however, and was writhing from the pain, mm -hmm. a movement that made her entrails stream out even more. In horror, I stopped to pray for her, and just in those few moments, all of her intestines spilled out from her stomach. Helpless to help her, I continued walking down the steps. I exited the building onto the big main street and found people standing around in a daze, wondering what had happened to them. They looked like ghosts rather than human beings. A few screamed when they saw the amount of blood that was streaming from my arm, enough to create a puddle around me. Now again, she was 14 at the time. How can you comprehend something like this when you are a 14-year-old? You know, and so the work that you're doing to try to bring the magnitude of this is so critical, mm -hmm. you know, I would say. Now I understand that you also have produced a number of films on this topic. Can you tell us about them? Well, two, mm -hmm. uh, with Bob Richter, mm -hmm. who's been making films for many years. Um, in fact, I'm, I'm very privileged to work with Bob. He uh, is the still only producing documentary filmmaker from the famed Ed Murrow, Fred Friendly, CBS Reports unit. Wow. So wow. Um, Bob has been making documentary films for quite some time. Mm -hmm. and. Um, we stumbled upon each other by pure magic, <laughs> I would say. Okay. And um, Bob and I went over to Nagasaki in 2004 mm -hmm. and interviewed um, two atomic bomb survivors. The story is primarily about um, 
Shimohira-san, Sakue Shimohira, and um, also Koichi Wada. And we also um, delve into the decision to use nuclear weapons, um, some of the things that many viewers have expressed that they didn't realize, such as the um, censorship that happened in Japan, um, occupied Japan, uh, the U.S. enforced press code, mm -hmm. as well as the Atomic Bomb Casualty Commission, where um, atomic bomb survivors were basically treated as guinea pigs and mm -hmm. were um, observed but not treated. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so there are many elements of the story that um, get sort of clouded in the victorious um, and mm -hmm. triumphant writing of history that the winners of war often do. Mm -hmm. And um, one of the things that was extraordinarily unfortunate and a very um, huge missed opportunity was for the world to understand what it meant to survive an atomic bomb mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and for the world to understand this mysterious illness that many survivors um, either survived or later died from, which was radiation sickness. Mm -hmm. And um, one of the uh, people that we interview in our film, um, Saito-san, who was a journalist, said he really firmly believes that if the world had understood mm -hmm. what nuclear weapons meant, we would have, um, you know, held back, perhaps, of course, as hypothetical, but mm -hmm. we could have held back from developing um, nuclear weapons, which rolled over, of course, into the Cold War, into now mm -hmm. what well, we have nine nations that have nuclear weapons, and we mm -hmm. live probably in the an, as unstable a nuclear world as one could imagine. Mm -hmm. um, we don't have as many in number uh, as we did at the height of the Cold War, but we have more nations that have nuclear weapons and certainly more that are uh, striving to attain them. Mm -hmm. Any country that has a nuclear reactor can build a nuclear bomb. So mm -hmm. that's mm -hmm. around 44 at the moment, mm -hmm. although there are nine recognized nuclear weapons countries. Mm -hmm. Now, can you tell us the name of the film that you just described? Um, that film was called The Last Atomic Bomb. The Last Atomic Bomb. Okay. And actually, I would like to extend from that, if I may, the point that you mentioned, and I agree, this is not taught in history classes, the fact that people didn't get the care that they needed, you know, afterwards. And again, I would like to return to of what course. Fumiko yes, Hashizumi yes. said. Please. So this is something that, for me, was a surprise. I can tell you I lived in Tokyo for 12 years, and before I moved there, I had just assumed that after these atomic bombs were dropped that the Red Cross went in and, and the Americans helped, and indeed this was not the case. I would like to read you another excerpt from the interview with Fumiko Hashizumi. She said that afterwards, no agency or government came to our aid because what had been done to Hiroshima was being kept secret by both the U.S. and the Japanese governments. The U.S. wanted to avoid international condemnation of the bombing, and the Japanese government wanted to avoid public shock and delusionment at home. American planes flew overhead to take copious photos of the cities, but they did not allow others to photograph the city or to write about it nor did they permit doctors to come from outside the city to treat us. Even the Red Cross was prohibited from entering. Survival, therefore, was up to each individual, each family. Now, later in the interview, she describes that their family saw these wonderful, what they thought were clinics to treat them being built, but it turned out that those doctors in those clinics, and they were Americans, didn't want to treat them. They just wanted to kind of conduct tests on them. Mm -hmm. And so she said later on, the bombings you see had been a large scale human experiment and we were the specimens. Mm -hmm. Now this is a perspective clearly I had not heard until mm -hmm. I moved to Japan and this backs up what you say. Mm -hmm. Now if I may, I would like to turn to something very interesting that you just got back from and this is the uh, peace boat journey that you were just on. This is, um, Dr. Sullivan was on a boat with a lot of atomic bomb survivors and they were traveling the world to teach people about, you know, this issue that happened. But when you were on the boat, this nuclear crisis in Japan happened. So mm -hmm. can you tell us a little bit about the reactions of the atomic bomb survivors when they realized what had happened in Japan. Mm. Well, first of all, I just want to um, introduce the uh, Peace Boat, mm -hmm. it, which is a wonderful 
organization um, in Tokyo, based in Tokyo, mm -hmm. um, started by um, an incredible man called Yoshioka, and um, this is the 72nd Global Voyage of Peace Boat, wow. which is very extraordinary. I think that the, the organization itself has been going strong for well over 20 years. Mm -hmm. And Yoshioka believed when he was a student that um, there was a problem with the textbooks. And mm -hmm. I know, that as you've lived in Japan, you mm -hmm. know that there's still a great textbook controversy about how history is portrayed yes. between Chinese, Japanese, Koreans, you know, there's still mm -hmm. quite a bit of controversy. So mm -hmm. Yoshioka decided to um, charter a boat and to go to those places to learn from um, people in other countries. So <laughs> like dispense with the textbooks, mm -hmm. get on a boat and go and find out for yourself. Huh. Well that turned into this wonderful nonprofit organization in Tokyo called Peace Boat. Mm -hmm. And as I said, it's a 72nd voyage that is just rounding back to, t to Yokohama now. Mm -hmm. They'll return on from their global journey on um, April 19th. Mm -hmm. I joined the ship in um, Trinidad mm -hmm. and um, this is the fourth um, what we're calling Orizuru Project, mm -hmm. um, which is the project hosted by Peace Boat to bring atomic bomb survivors on it, on these global journeys so that they can uh, meet with people in the various ports and give their testimony mm -hmm. of hope and survival and, you know, really grist to the mill for nuclear disarmament. That's one of Peace Boat's um, major focuses mm -hmm. is um, the pursuit of nuclear disarmament. Mm -hmm. And my other wonderful colleague, Akira Kawasaki, who's a sort of director of the Orizuru project, um, this is the fourth one. The first one was 104 hibakusha traveling around the world. And hibakusha, if you could explain I'm what that sorry. means. I'm <laughs> sorry. Hibakusha is the yeah. Japanese word for atomic bomb survivor. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, their average age right now is uh, rounding into the late 70s. Okay. So we, it is really a precious opportunity for us to hear their stories. Mm -hmm. You know, through Hibakusha Stories, we're bringing um, atomic bomb survivors to New York City. Mm -hmm. Through the Peace Boat Project, we're bringing atomic bomb survivors throughout the entire world. Wow. And um, that is just such a privilege and an honor. Oh, yeah. And um, this last voyage, the, the, the 72nd voyage of Peace Boat, mm -hmm. the fourth of the um, Orizuru project to bring mm -hmm. atomic bomb survivors on these global journeys. Mm -hmm. This one was quite special because the nine hibakusha who are on board right now mm -hmm. have been recognized by the Japanese government um, as uh, special communicators for nuclear disarmament. Wow, so what does that mean? It means that these people have been recognized okay. by the Japanese government as um, disarmament educators, as people Super. who mm -hmm. are able to give their testimony, mm -hmm. as atomic bomb survivors. Okay. Um, of course, you know, this would be a much longer interview to go into how the atomic bomb survivors at first were ignored by the Japanese government. They faced mm -hmm. enormous discrimination mm -hmm. um, in Japan because people were, you know, what's this mysterious disease? One day you're fine and the next day you're... Right. So yeah. there, there still remains discrimination against Hibakusha, but mm -hmm. they fought for their rights. They fought for the Japanese government to support them mm -hmm. medically mm -hmm. so that they can have their medical... Um, expenses paid for by the government and they have an official recognition okay but now the Japanese government is coming forward and has been a very I have to say on the level of the UN has been a great proponent of um, disarmament education mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. in recognizing the role of the Hibakusha mm -hmm. as um, storytellers and as these you know extraordinarily inspirational people um, this is really um, an important step, I believe, for the Japanese government and for people to recognize the power of the voices of the Hibakusha. So these nine mm -hmm. extraordinary people mm -hmm. have been on board Peace Boat since the end of January. Oh, okay. And we traveled together on a disarmament education project. Mm -hmm. So we actually left the ship um, in Las Palmas, Canary Islands, okay. and flew to Warsaw, Poland, mm -hmm. where we traveled to Auschwitz. Okay. And we had an exchange with Auschwitz survivors, mm -hmm. 
um, atomic bomb survivors oh, okay. and Polish high school students. Oh, incredible. It was totally incredible. amazing. Yeah. And it was, um, it was just an extraordinary opportunity for younger mm -hmm. generations to learn from people who had literally survived hell on earth. Exactly. And they've come through with their humanity mm -hmm. and their passion for peace. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, when we were in Auschwitz for the second day, mm -hmm. um, the devastating earthquake and tsunami hit. Okay. And at that point, um, we recognized that, you know, Fukushima was going to be a very, very difficult and ongoing situation. Okay. What was very unique and exciting about this journey before Fukushima mm -hmm. um, is that the Hibaksha traveled from Yokohama to Tahiti mm -hmm. on board with um, an incredible education um, opportunity which was bringing young Aboriginal women mm -hmm. and um, survivors from atmospheric testing from the French testing in Tahiti mm -hmm. together with the Hibaksha. So they basically oh. um, had a loop on the whole nuclear fuel cycle from uranium mining mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to the development of fissile materials which can mm -hmm. be used in either reactors mm -hmm. or in um, nuclear weapons mm -hmm. and to the explosion of nuclear weapons and the fallout that um, mm -hmm. exists from that you know process mm -hmm. um, these three groups work together and the Hibaksha said you know the core issue of the problem is radiation mm -hmm. radiation is what lasts after the nuclear bomb so we must focus as Hibaksha Mm -hmm. on the entire nuclear fuel cycle. By that I mean mm -hmm. uranium mining, milling uranium, you know, separating out the radionuclides that you're going to be using in a reactor, putting it into a reactor, creating plutonium, and that plutonium can be used for nuclear weapons. Mm -hmm. And along each process, nuclear waste is created, mm -hmm. which no country anywhere has any idea of what to do with. Right. Um, yeah. These invisible, nearly timeless poisons that can mutate the gene genome and cause cancer mm -hmm. for, in the case of plutonium, as we mentioned earlier, up to 250,000 years. Mm -hmm. So this is patently insane. Mm -hmm. And human beings make mistakes all the time. Nuclear technology is a technology that cannot be um, ha cannot have mistakes made around it. Mm -hmm. And so during this great discussion learning session with the Aboriginal mm -hmm. women and the Tahitian um, atomic test victims, mm -hmm. um, they came to this conclusion, radiation is the problem. Now this mm -hmm. is significant because mm -hmm. some Hibaksha say, you know, nuclear weapons are the problem, nuclear power is a sort of necessary evil. Japan mm -hmm. doesn't have a lot of natural resources, so we have to use nuclear power. Mm -hmm. But this particular group of Hibaksha who are recognized as special communicators mm -hmm. on disarmament have taken a stand to say radiation is at the core of the concern. Mm -hmm. So the fact that Fukushima has happened on this journey um, is important because well, I, it can't, I can't say it's important. It's a terrible tragedy. It is just an ongoing event. Um, just today, they have risen it to level seven, which, yeah. according to industry standards, is the highest level. Mm -hmm. um, I just hope, mm -hmm. and many people around the world hope, mm -hmm. that the um, exceptional destruction and the silent killer that radiation is mm -hmm will at least sound the death knell to the nuclear industry mm -hmm. because a lot of people are suffering mm -hmm. and a lot of people will continue to suffering from the long-lived radioactive um, contamination that is spewing forth from that facility and mm -hmm. that is not to say that the um, nearly 24,000 people who have died as a result of the earthquake and tsunami. Mm -hmm. You know, the the level of human suffering happening in Northeast Japan right now is it just is. exceptional. Yeah. So I'd mm -hmm. also like to point out that Peace Boat mm -hmm. is um, operating a volunteer force mm -hmm. and people are going up into the tsunami stricken area and they are bringing hot food, they're taking care of people in the evacuation centers, they're clearing off debris from the roads, they're doing an absolutely fantastic job. Mm -hmm. So if people want to contribute financially, mm -hmm. they can go to the Peace Boat website, peaceboat.org, mm -hmm. and um, contribute to a very local, very grassroots, um, wonderful, uh, 
relief effort. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. And we, of course, will will include that URL so people can see it. Now, I think the link that you made between, you know, this the atomic bombing and also what happened in Fukushima is very important because, as you say, a lot of people see these as two completely separate topics. And the fact that these designated communicators came out with a joint statement is also, you know, extremely significant. Let me ask you a question. When you were on board with these, was it all women or was it men and women? Men or? and women. What was the emotional reaction when they got this news? Well, first of all, because we were on land, um, we were able to see television, because on board we don't have television or um, any newspaper or anything like that. Okay. So they were, I mean, it was shock. Shock. You know? I, I, can, I can imagine that it would be shock, I mean, clearly. Now, I'm realizing that our segment is almost up right now, and so I want to thank you so much for having joined us. And it, your work is very critical, and we wish you all of the best. And clearly, Hibakusha stories, we will invite people to go there. What I would like to do, just in closing, is return to Fumiko Hashizumi. Now, it's interesting because she had been living in Tokyo, but she recently returned to Hiroshima because she was concerned about the, radio, the radiation there. Now, she is actually a very gifted poet. And I would like to finish with a poem that she said, that, that she wrote, and here it is. It's called School Playground. Uh, Sakuma Kazuko, Sakuma Kazuko, lying among the piles of bodies scattered all over the playground. Kazuko hears her father calling her name. His voice comes clearer and clearer. He stops at her feet, but her burnt, festering eyes cannot see him standing there. Her arms and legs are lifeless. Not knowing how to find his beloved child among the bodies strewing the ground like rags, with their burnt, peeling skin, her father simply wanders round and round, calling out her name in anguish. Kazuko cries out too, again and again, but no sound will come from her seared and swollen throat. The sound of her father's footsteps and his voice gradually fade away into the distance. Tears stream down Kazuko's cheeks, the only sign she is alive. Now, one would hope that this devastating legacy of nuclear, nuclear issues will end. And I would agree with you, Dr. Kathleen Sullivan, for um, your hope that clearly something good will come out of this disaster. And once again, we thank you so much for having joined us. And we thank you very much for having joined us tonight as well.